Hi, Simon. How's it going? This is Paul, uh, Paul Coffer speaking from uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, how's life there? Yeah, pretty good. Uh, lockdown, like everyone else, was a pain in the backside, but uh, we've got through it. Probably going to have another one, but in the meantime, the science goes on. That's, uh, that's good to hear. It's pretty much the same here in the Netherlands. It's, it's changed things around a lot, actually, and, and, and I guess uh, we should probably try and uh, talk a little bit about how things were in a pre-COVID time rather than how they are uh, yeah. now. Uh, and I was uh, wondering for you, you know, how, how do you normally you know, keep your lab going in, 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 in Abraham? What's your kind of motivation? How do you motivate people working there? Um, I guess my motivation has been, is the same now as it's always been, which is just curiosity. Um, um, we all recognize these days that we, we have to try and badge our work as, uh, you know, leading to this um, social and economic advancement and things like that. And of course, we always have an eye on that. But at the end of the day, I'm, I do what I do because I'm curious about biology. And I think most of the people in my lab are exactly the same. So motivation isn't normally a problem because, you know, we're all just curious. I think I, I totally agree with this. So, I mean, um, uh, definitely, I think probably the same for me as it was for you growing up as a scientist. This was the, one of the driving factors and the things that was instilled in us. So just to really, you know, understand something, to really know something and to really you know, want to know the result that you, that you want to get to get it yesterday as soon as possible and yeah. passionate for it. Um, but I have, a I have a feeling also that things have changed a little bit since then, that the curiosity driven science is maybe, um, I'm not saying sidelined at all, but uh, the, the more... Um, you know, themic uh, translational aspects of science have maybe taken over. Do you, do you feel that too? Yeah, I do. And I understand that. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's a circle. Um, I think, you know, the funders will have you believe that basic science leads to translational insights and it's a one-way street. But I think we both recognise that it's a circle and that you can do an, a translational research project. You can you can investigate something in a cancer cell, which will shed light on fundamental basic biology. So it's it's... It's circular. Yeah, I, don't totally, I totally agree with you. I mean, this, this innovation cycle, or whatever you want to call it, is, is probably the most important and very important for us as basic scientists to, to, to show how that feeds back around, I think. Yeah. And what do you, what do you, what do you think, like, um, uh, I think about this a lot, what's, what's changed so much since when, when we were PhD students? Though? How do you think things have changed? Now? Uh, I, I think technologies are just moving forward at such a speed now that um that it and that it you know it's in, it's very difficult to keep up with everything and um i mean i i say to my guys that they have to be responsible for keeping up with the literature on their relevant projects because you know you know if we've got half a half a dozen projects in the lab i cannot you probably you probably feel the same i cannot keep up Impossible. with technical technological advances and the literature on each of those projects and so i have they have to be willing to step up and take ownership of that um, and then come to me and say, look, have you seen this? We need to integrate this into our project. And, you know, so, so yeah, I think, I think it's just the pace of change and the pace of, of development of technologies. I, mean, I think that nowadays, indeed, you, you uh, the amount of literature compared with 20 years ago is you know, extreme. Uh, yeah. It's really hard, even if you're just, you know, with your own, within your own project, if you have one project to deal with it. And also the expertise that's required to, to perform experiments with the technologies that we have now has really become, you know, a whole field of its own. Yep. And it is impossible, I think, as a supervisor to, to be able to keep up on all these aspects. So I, I totally agree with you. I think for me, also, the, I had a feel, feeling when I was younger, younger scientists, how things worked in the labs I worked in, that it was much more individualistic to some degree and nowadays it's impossible to be individualistic and even if you wanted to be yeah. you require so many more people to to get a project off the ground and to move forward with the technologies you were talking about i mean yeah. i think it's so impossible you, you did your phd with jim right so tell us about that what was it like so that was a, a, a great time. I mean, I, I'm uh, um, old enough to be, you know, started my PhD in the end of the, of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, when molecular biology was really, you know, taking off and you could do stuff which you couldn't do before. It was much more biochemical. And you know, the, the cell was this black box and, and you know, the interests, uh, I worked in uh, what, what was the Ludwig Institute in London at the time. Um, it was a spin-off from the CRUK Institute that was there. And there, you know, we had a lot of people who were interested in uh, intracellular signaling. And uh, basically back in the late 80s, and, you know, we didn't really understand at all how signals went from the outside of the cell to, to the nucleus and how they caused changes in gene transcription. There was so much to, to find and so much you know, knowledge to find. Uh, it was a fascinating time. The only thing I think 
I look back on it now, I mean, and I'm sure you'll appreciate the same thing, the, the technologies we had back then were, were extremely primitive compared with today. And so the, the amount of hard work you had to do to make very small steps uh, is very different from today. You know? uh, but at the end of the day, everything you found was quite new. So the novelty was really there. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and that was the big thing for me. So I, I love the buzz of it. I love the, you know, the fact that we were slowly piecing together these pathways from how the outside of the cell gets to the nucleus and you know, you're doing your little part in the piecing of that together. Yeah. I love that. I really did. And, and how about you? I guess you have similar uh, experiences. Very, very similar experiences. I was always fascinated by signaling as an undergraduate and, and the fact that you, know, you could stimulate cells with a hormone or a growth factor and you could measure things happening inside cells within seconds and was just, for me, it was you know, more dynamic than, than Krebs cycle or glycolysis <laughs> or whatever, you know, and it was just more, it just captured my imagination. And, and mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to work in Michael Wakelum's lab at the University of Glasgow. And that was, yeah, exactly as you described, a really exciting time, lots of new things emerging and signaling all the time. and and. It, it, Mike had a very self-motivated bunch of people, postdocs and yeah. students. You know, we were working long hours and weekends because we wanted to. Nobody was telling us to because we just wanted to see the next results. Um, exactly. Have the same the same feeling there. It's like what you described before about what drives people. I think. Yeah. It, yeah. it was an intrinsic dr being driven because you want to know, you know, yeah. how this pathway is going to turn out yeah. at the end of the day. I think. What was what was James like as a as a supervisor? I mean, did he encourage you to? kind of take ownership or was he quite kind of hands-on or um yeah I, I think for me so i mean i when i finished my undergraduate degree to be honest uh i had very little training in lab work very little training compared with the students that i take on now at least in the netherlands uh, uh um situation uh so i really uh you know i had i didn't know how to hold a pipette and, and uh, you know, as, as, as we know, a, a British PhD of, of three years, when you're starting out not knowing how to hold a pair, is quite a race, yep. uh, as all PhDs are, actually. But this was particularly a race. And I think I was pretty incompetent, to be honest, in the early days. And it took me quite a lot of help, people helping me, uh, postdocs in the lab. Jim, at the time, uh, I mean, I had a very young supervisor, Jim Woodgett, uh, for those who were interested. And he was 28, 29 as PI extremely young, had come from uh, uh, Phil Cohen and Tony Hunter's labs, which are, you know, the gods of, of sickening and kinases back yeah. in the time. Uh, and, the, you know, the pressure was on for him to, uh, to really, you know, prove himself as a very, very young PI. Uh, he was super hands-on, so he was working equally as hard. And in fact, I can be honest, I'd be very frustrated when I would come in on a Saturday morning and Jim would already be there <laughs> as my boss in the lab pipetting uh you know so uh, there was there was a, a quite a quite a challenge and the, the bar was very very high i must admit and i was a bit of a slow learner but it really pushed me and it pushed me i mean i had the passion and the curiosity but i just didn't have the skills i think in the beginning and it, it really pushed me and was surrounded by very talented people mm -hmm. to pick stuff up and i think he really helped me in uh, my scientific way of thinking i mean also yeah. the, the motivation and curiosity aspects but also just the way of approaching problem which at that time at least at that time and and, and my my how i was driven to to, to do things yeah. so i think that really really uh, uh helped me um not to, I mean, we didn't have a super close relationship but we were, we were you know a small lab in a small institute that was nice mm -hmm. it was definitely a good time i mean i don't know how how was your how were your experiences yeah i mean very similar i i was pretty green when i joined mike's lab but um i was determined i wanted to do a phd in signaling and and his was, his was the last lab I got the opportunity to interview at and he, I got in and um, I was very fortunate to be mentored by a couple of very good postdocs, yeah. uh, Sue Pine, Robert, mm. and, and these people are like gold dust in a lab, you know, getting, yeah. getting people onboarded and helping them to, to learn the techniques and, to, to, and also to set standards for how to do things, you know. To, um, Mike was incredibly enthusiastic, but he was also generous. He, even from an early stage, he allowed he allowed us to develop our own ideas. I, I, I was supposed to, my PhD was supposed to purify an enzyme and I quickly realized that I was gonna spend like half my time <laughs> in the cold room and I wasn't having that. So I actually I actually decamped to the library for a, a week and came up with some other ideas and presented them to Mike. And I, th I realize now that that was an incredibly arrogant thing to do. Yes. Well, well, not arrogant, but it was, I, I think that was quite unusual, I would say. But, and, and uh, well, it was just motivated by me not wanting to be cold for half for, for three years. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but the, the point was that he was actually very generous. He sat down and listened and said, yeah, OK, give it a go. And, you know, that was really the making of me. So uh, 
but yeah, it was a very exciting time and uh, very, very much benefited from teamwork and, and good, good colleagues helping along the way. So. I think for me, the biggest step was, or the most important step actually was after that is I, I moved to the Netherlands for a postdoc to the Hubrecht Institute. Um, and there, I, my new supervisor at the time, uh, after six or seven months was offered a professorship on the other side of the country and asked me if I would go. And although I know Holland's a very small country, but still it's, uh, it was two or three hours away and I just literally just settled and I was like, I don't want to go. So he was kind enough to let me stay uh, also with a technician who worked with me uh, and basically do my own thing. And he was so busy setting up his lab there, he kind of, not that he forgot about me, but he just let me basically do what I want. And, and I really, that experience that you just described, I basically did a completely different project than the one I was supposed to do. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that's very good advice to everybody, but I could do it. Uh, and it really taught me how to become an independent scientist. Yeah. I really got put in the deep end, but in a positive way. I, but by, with Jim's uh, tutorage from beforehand, I was almost ready for it, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and that really, for me, was the most exciting period and actually one of the most productive periods I had. Uh, also, just finding my way, finding collaborations. And, you know, the, the, the thing which we've uh, discussed on other occasions is, you know, serendipity, meeting, bumping into the right people at the right time, accidentally finding something which really catches your attention and going with it. Uh, and that was for me good. I don't, I don't know how you, how you would um, compare your PhD experience with your, with your postdoc experience in that respect. Um, well, I mean, my postdoc experience was very serendipitous. I went, I met Frank McCormick at a conference, got, got drunk with him and asked him for a job. And, um, and <laughs> And the rest is history, but um, but but Frank was was different again from Michael. But actually, I think in the common feature of both of them as PhD supervisor and postdoc supervisor was that they cared about the work, but they cared about the individual as well. And you know, I think, and you can't do one without the other. Well, you can, but you'll have a very unhappy lab, I think. And and yeah. so, and particularly for a PhD student, you know, I, I don't think. PhD supervision is a one size fits all thing. I think you, you, everyone's different and, and they have different um, strengths. They come to you with different strengths and different skills, um, but maybe uh, some areas where they're not so polished and you, know, you need to nurture and, and help them. And both Michael and Frank did that in different ways. And uh, you know, so I think those were two really formative experiences for me, which, which kind of, I hope has taught me how to, to, to run my lab in a way which encourages people and supports people. Yeah, that's so good. I think one thing I missed out on uh, uh, looking back on it and only, uh, only caught up many years later is to have worked in a sort of uh, as, a, as a more senior scientist, as a postdoc or a more senior postdoc in, in a high, you know, in a big lab, yeah. a big, you know, with a big supervisor. And, with a, and, and you know, and I actually did a sabbatical in 2013. So much, 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 much later mm -hmm. and got that experience for the first time, which really was something I wish I'd had a bit younger is to have that experience of being in that environment, not just, just as a PhD student, but as a postdoc when, you know, yeah. when you really are more competent and you really know where you want to go. Yeah. I think that would have been for me a thing that, that would have helped, even though I just you know, told you that my independence was incredibly important for my development. Yeah. I think it, I missed the little period of, of having the tutorage of a, you know, a big lab with the big name and really uh, um, yeah. at a point where I was m more competent to know where I was going or what I wanted to do and to be able to have this you know, brainstorming uh, experience with, uh, with a senior scientist. I think I missed that a bit. If, I, if we were to think about you know, what, are, what do we think are the most important things of a, a PhD should look the most important characteristics, if you want to put it that way. So what, what was it that you think, like, would you say are the most important things that you really need to have to start science? I think um, you've got to have an inquiring mind. It's no good turning up to do a PhD um, and expect to be told what to do. I mean, you know, obviously you've come to, to work on a specific project. So uh, in that sense, you are being told what to do, but you've got to be able to... Uh, follow your nose you've got to have the courage to ask your own questions and progress your own ideas not be afraid of that and I think you know that courage is the word there I think sometimes it does it does require courage to to buck the trend and say no actually I'm going to try this because I think it, it's really interesting um and that, part of that is is mm -hmm. this this kind of idea of owning your project you know and and taking control exactly. of the project and 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 Sometimes it'll go well and other times, it'll, you know, you'll fall flat on your face. And that's that's another part of it. It's, it's um, being prepared for failures. And, and, and um, but um, I think the people who in my lab who have gone on to really good things, I think they set themselves very high personal standards in their work. Um, yeah. they, they, 
they intuitively knew when something wasn't good enough and needed to be done again or done differently using an orthogonal approach to you know to really be thorough uh, they also had sharp eyes uh, for something unusual something that they didn't expect yes. and mm -hmm. I, I, i'm sure you must know this but it's it, it, i think one of the critical things is the willingness to embrace the unexpected result you know if 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 you discuss an experiment with a phd student they go off and do it and they come back and say yeah i you know i we got the result that we expected well that's fine but that's that's kind of an incremental advance you know it's the it, the, the real joy is when they come back to you and say uh, I don't think it worked because I didn't expect this result. And that's when you know you're so onto something good. So being comfortable with the unexpected, I think, is really important. And then the really obvious things are persistence, um, uh, hard work, um, a certain robustness because things will fail and then they'll fail again. Um, and that's what that's what science is like. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm not selling it, am I? <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, would add, I would think I want to add to that actually because I've been thinking a lot about uh, also about well, a lot. I've been thinking about about failure, uh, and f failure is a, is a, you know it's a strange word because uh, negative data, for example, I don't think it's failure at all. And you were alluding to that. Negative data can be hypothesis changing. You know, it can develop your your scientific question, and, and it's in my opinion is just as important as, as positive data. It, it's I mean the the failure is you know a technical failure, of course. Yeah, is, yeah. Yeah. If you drop your cells on the floor, it's not, <laughs> you, you could call that a failure. But uh, when you actually have a research question and you answer it in with a hypothesis and you answer it and, and it turns out to be incorrect, that data will, will help to shape where you're going to go with taking the question further. So I think this is, you know, I, I, I hope I can instill my uh, uh, PhD students and young, the young scientists around me with this too, that, you know, don't, if it doesn't give the, the, the answer you want, don't, you know, it's, that's, that can be a good thing as long as it gives an answer, you know, whatever it is, yeah. you can move forward with it. And, and, and I think also uh, in terms of failure, one thing that's quite interesting to think about a project is if you're starting something, I tend to be devil's advocate, if I'm honest, with a lot of the new things that we start up, which have come from the postdocs, the PhDs. I see that as my kind of job is to challenge them and, mm -hmm. and to convince me that we really should be doing this. But it's to think if a project, if a project you're doing uh, would fail, uh, what would it be that made it fail? And thinking about those kind of things too can really help you in uh, designing where you're going to go, which experiments are critical, you know, what you need to do. And that's again thinking about failure in a, in a kind of positive way because it's just helping you to redirect your your yeah. hypothesis. You know, yeah. an hypothesis is an hypothesis, and it's yeah. almost never correct, as we both know. <laughs> no, I, I think you're absolutely right, particularly about the kind of uh, negative data is not a failure. And I think you know, I think we sometimes forget. I, I think some people in 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 these fast moving days, people think this is a quaint idea, but actually, a PhD is about a training. It's, it, it is training green scientists in how to be researchers. And so hypothesis testing, um, you know, yeah, of course, let's embrace big data because, you know, we all, we all do that now, but actually uh, em embrace it in a way which is testing hypotheses. And, and as you say, if, if it's not what you thought, if it's not what you were expecting, then it gives you pause for thought. And that is part of the training as well. Um, so, yeah, completely. Yeah. And, and failure, I mean... What does failure look like in a lab, uh, in a science lab? I think failure potentially is almost every day. You know, things go wrong that are out of our control almost every day. Experiments just go wrong. You know, as you say, a negative or positive is, is not failure, but things just happen. To, it's not going to work. That approach is not going to work. Papers will scoop us. Grants won't get funded. You know, these things happen all the time. Mm. And it's important to recognise routes around these kind of setbacks. You know, I mean... You know, it's important to step back however, however you have to step back, whether that's go to the gym and punch it out with a punch bag, go and stand in a field and scream, um, you know, whatever you've got to do, but then re-engage and, and actually say, okay, so things are different now. How does this change things for us? How do we take this forward? How does this new information, which, you know, yeah, it may scoop us, but actually in another way, it gives us a new perspective on this project. So how can we, how can we take it forward? Um, and that, you know, as a, as a supervisor, you have to help people to get, get through those moments and, and, and get to that point of saying, okay, right, it's different now. What, do we, what have we learned from this and how can we take it forward? So, so I mean, we've uh, changed, things have changed the last few months, of course, because we've gone online with pretty much everything yeah. we do in terms of meetings. I was wondering 
has there been other changes, you know, tech, tech or you know, apps or stuff, that, you know, apart from the, the, the technological stuff for the science that you use to, to, to keep your lab running, uh, particularly now? As um, a- I mean, obviously during these times, yeah, you know, everyone's on Zoom, right? So we, when we couldn't do... Um, when we couldn't do lab work, we were having uh, lots of journal clubs by Zoom and things like that. And every everyone would take a figure in a paper and critique it. And 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 that's been useful to kind of remind ourselves mm. about critical thinking. Uh, Pre-COVID, in normal times, uh, technology and apps for uh, uh, tracking projects. No, not really. We we're kind of old school. We talk to each other. <laughs> we. Um, we have, you know, we talk to each other in the lab. We talk to each other at lab meetings. Lab meetings are very, uh, everyone just shows their latest results, the good and the not so good, you know, and we all critique it and we all contribute suggestions on how, on what to try if it's not going wrong. Um, and it's all done from a point of, you know, the egos are left at the door. We're not interested in um, belittling people and things like that it, we're all interested in trying it in everyone's projects going forward and so comments and suggestions and criticisms are made constructively uh, as a team to try and help each individual's project progress um, so yeah I guess we're kind of old school in that sense <laughs> what about you well um I, t- I mean, I totally agree with you, what you just said about lab meetings. I mean, I think you have to create an environment where people feel uh, safe and where they can show and discuss anything, uh, can admit they don't understand something, can ask for help. These are so important to any lab to have a, you know, to have a good functioning lab, I think, uh, to make sure the science moves forward. So I have to talk about that. And we've, I guess, I'm a, I'm a horrible uh, tech head, so I, I love any kind of technology I can. But having said that, we actually use very little before COVID, very little after COVID. Things have changed. So uh, before COVID, we use Slack actually. So I hate uh, WhatsApp because I have that privately, and I do not want to get my work and my private messages on the same app. <laughs> so we use Slack for work, uh, and it's great actually. Uh, and it's really started now to develop into subgroups uh, where people you know, with working on similar related projects can really connect with each other and show data and stuff. Uh, and we've been forced, and I, and I say that in a, in, a, in a positive way, actually, to finally switch to using electronic lab journals, uh, which we hadn't been doing before. Uh, as it's just come in this year. We've been very slow. It's been a huge, huge step and very difficult for everybody to make the move to yeah. use a proper data management plan, to have a directory structure where data is saved and you can find it back again as a PI, yeah. that kind of thing. Uh, and the, actually, in, in terms of the talking, we, uh, what indeed we, you, you miss in kind of this, this new, uh, new world that we're in is these, you know, the, the, the coffee machine moments and the stuff where you want to just say something at that time because you have to structure everything. So what we have done is we use Trello, actually, which we set up a board where people can put like successes, failures, help, um, anything they want to, information, fun stuff. And, and basically people at the, at the moment when you actually have the problem or the thing or whatever, you can just stick it on the Trello board. Right. And at the beginning of our work discussion every week now, we go through the board basically and look at successes and failures and help. And that, that kind of has taken over from the, 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 the moments that you would normally have in the lab of interacting with each other, which are not happening at all. And certainly yeah. with me because I'm stuck at home most of the time. Yeah. So I think that's, that's actually been a good thing. And I think even if we go back to normality, I might keep that because it's actually quite a, a good thing. Uh, people feel comfortable in putting all kinds of stuff onto that, which we can then discuss together at a later date. Yeah. I think that's the, the main thing we use. So how do you, um, so if a, if a new graduate student joins your lab, how do you get them <clears throat> settled in? I guess they, they use the phrase on board these days, don't they? How do you get them settled in and, and, yeah. and set up? That's again a very personal experience, I think, as you, you, you were saying, and everyone's different. Uh, but I mean, th- what I tend to do is for the first year of the PhD, I make very concrete plans. Uh, and for postdocs, it's, it's, it's concrete, but it's less detailed, I would say. Yeah. Um, I, I really try to give them something which they have, which they go like, this is what I'm doing. You know, they can say, this is what I'm doing. I don't, I don't like the, the swimming way of working, of letting people find their way in the, the first year. I like to give them something definite so they really can be confident about the questions they want to answer and how they're going to do it. And what I think is important, that it's been for me, at least in the structure of my lab, also because I do a lot of non-lab related stuff within the university, is to have a hierarchy of, of um, postdocs, PhD students and, and technicians who work together. So, you know, I have basically an equal balance of each and, uh, and usually a PhD student will be connected with one or more postdocs and there might be a technician who's associated with that 
probably to some degree, and it's, they can learn. So I basically say to them at the beginning, you know, you're going to learn this technique from this person and this from this person. And everyone, that's again about creating the right environment in your, in your research group. In general, I've never really noticed that anyone had any problems with helping somebody out. Uh, and the opposite of being enthusiastic to take on board a new person and get them up to speed on the technical stuff. So all that's done like that. And then I think in the, this sort of, uh, it sounds like a bit of a control freak and I don't mean it that way at all, but to give direction, strong direction in the first year and so for six months and then try to let people and as individuals are different as we just discussed to let them see how they want to move on with that, you know, and how they want how they want to bring into the project their own things, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if that's how you also uh, very, very similar. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's important for, for PhDs to get them started on a very clear project. As you say, I always have a plan A and a plan B because um, inev inevitably plan A, you know, may fall by the wayside. So you need to have that um, provision. Um, I've been very fortunate. I have two institute scientists in my group who, are, but who, who each have worked with me for about 20 years. Continuity. And, yeah, continuity is so important, but also that, you know, they know my mind about things, you know, they, you know, they, they know kind of my expectations, I guess. And, they, and so they will mentor new students, um, teach them critical techniques. Um, and, you know, those people are like gold dust and, and yes. very important. Um, Kathy Baumano and Becky Gilly, just to mention them. And, um, you know, and, and these people are really important and that helps to, to get people on board and get them moving. But then as, as we discussed, as, as the first year progresses, you, you typically see some, some students that are then happy to take more ownership of their project. Uh, you know, and, and that happens at different rates for, for each student, obviously. But, but yeah, I think these, those, those are critical times and it's very important to have a, appropriate kind of senior postdocs and, and the like who can help out. Yeah. I totally, totally agree, agree with that. I have also a lab manager has been with me for 20 years and that, that changed that they basically know me. And that's what you just said. It's like they know me, yeah. they know when they need to, to disturb me and when they don't basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they can organize everything that I really have no idea anymore about how to organize. So it's, yeah. uh, it's perfect. I think our discussion is starting to, to, to wrap up. I was wondering if, if you were to go, you know, go back in time a bit, what would you change? Would you change anything? Crikey. Um, Oh, I, I'm, that's a real tough one. Um, I'm sure I made, I know I made several mistakes as a PhD student and uh, I'm, pro I'm sure I piss people off all the time. Um, <laughs> and, and so there are many, many apologies, but, but I, I, you know, I, I think you learn from your mistakes. So, um, and hopefully you take those things on board and actually become a better person, a, a better student, a better postdoc, and then hopefully a better supervisor. So, would I have done things differently? There are some things I, I'm sure I would have. Um, I would have probably listened more carefully to some people at the time. Um, uh, but um, I don't know. I, I, I think you learn from your mistakes and um, hopefully I think I have done that. And um, yeah, I don't know. What about you? That's a horrible question, isn't it? Yeah, it's a terrible question. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I think I feel pretty lucky in how things go. I mean, one thing that, that I, I really wouldn't change is where I've worked and who I've worked with, for sure. I mean, I've been super lucky and not, not even with super, act, with really, you know, with active choices. It's been pretty much just luck, yep. to be honest. But I, I've never really worked somewhere, and that's from my PhD, through my postdoc, my PI positions, through my sabbatical, where I haven't felt comfortable and I haven't felt enthusiastic because yeah. of the people around me to do what I want to do. But I, I think for me, um, we discussed at the beginning how important curiosity is, you know, and the, the passion for it. And I think that has been sometimes for me not so good in that I've lacked focus in some places. Yes. And I think I got caught up in too many different things where you, you know, you can't really, it's, it's clear you need to try to carve your way in a field. Yeah. And if you're involved in too many fields or spread too thinly across, and that's not always an advantage, to be honest. Um, and, and for me, what I did is I kind of, Started like this, went went like this, and 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 only only now actually in the last four or five years I started to come back again and bring certain things in the lab back together, and rather than having them as separate. And so I think I, I would change that a little bit, and maybe after my postdoc time when I set up my group as a PI, I maybe would have um, had more continuity from what I was doing as a postdoc through my. I changed completely direction at that point. Yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. So I think it's a bit more things I would change is a, a little bit more focused. But you're right. I mean, I, I learned from all the stuff that I didn't do well. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to change that because I I would not learn it. So uh, I, I think it's super important.
ironically, the things that I, I agree to entirely about focus, and ironically for me, the time when I didn't focus enough, um, I think was when I first set up my independent lab. I think I was, I was like a kid in a sweet shop and oh, that's cool, that's cool. We, should tr we should try that. And actually, I, I, I think I was quite lucky after four, three or four years, I realized that mistake. And, um, but I think, you know, you know, if you spread yourself too thin, then all that happens is that each project is just making small incremental advances. And, and yeah. so you, you need to try and focus on key things. I think during my PhD um, and to some extent my postdoc, I was actually pretty focused and, and at the PhD, certainly postdoc, it took about uh, nine months or so to find something to really get my teeth into. But then I was very focused once I had that. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think focus is key. And, and definitely for a PhD, yeah. Thanks, that's been a good discussion. Yeah, no, it's good been really good to catch up and uh, hopefully we can do it over a beer next time. That would be nice, wouldn't it? That really <laughs> would be nice, I hope so. <laughs> Great.